Welcome back to Force Crash Course. In the next couple of videos, we have some really cool topics to be discussing, and they all focus around data structures. So data structures like list, set, and map. And we'll go into the specifics of each of these in their own respective videos. And once we feel like we have a good understanding of those, we can finally go and talk about triggers, which are essentially the apex equivalent to creating a process builder or a workflow rule or even lead processes and all of those other great out-of-the-box features. But before we can talk about triggers and before we can truly understand what's going on, we have to understand these data structures and also understand how we can leverage them. So a list is just another type of variable. But what makes it special is you can store multiple values in a list. Let me show you what I mean. So let's say I wanted to have a list of the first name of all the different students in a classroom. I would make a string called student1, copy that, student2, his name would be Joe, student3, her name would be Sarah, and so forth, right? I would have to do this for all the different students that are out there. But what if I wanted to store these in some way that made sense to me? because these are all students and I wanna collect them all as one. And that's where a list can come in to help us. So to create a collection, it's actually really, really easy. You start off with the keyword list to tell Salesforce that you wanna make a list. You'll give that list a name. So I'll just call this student list. And using the new operator, we'll make a new list, that syntax, just like that. The only thing this is missing is telling Apex what type of list you're trying to make. So in this case, we're trying to make a list of type string or a list of strings. And from here, there's different methods that belong to lists that we can now call. So I can do student list and call dot add. And with dot add, I can add the values like that. So doing that for Mark, Joe, and Sarah, I now have a list of different students. So let's do a system debug and see what this looks like. Okay, so we saw Mark, Joe, and Sarah all collected as one. Now there's a couple different ways to print this out as well. So you'll see that these all got printed out on one line and it automatically added the commas there for us to represent that these are multiple different entities all in one list. What we could now do is use the for loop that we learned from our previous video in this. We could use this for loop to parse each individual uh, string in our list. And the syntax for this is you'll type in the name of the variable of that list and give this variable, a temporary variable, the name. So I'll just call it student. And in this part of the for loop, we'll add the name of the list. And I'll add a system debug. So what this does is it references the list of students. And for each student, for each string in that list, it'll do a system debug for us. So we should expect to see Mark, Joe, and Sarah all in their individual lines. Cool, there they are. And there's a lot we can do from there. If for whatever reason I wanted to print out that they're a student, we can do that. And there's a whole lot of methods available in the list class that we can use to our advantage. And it's hard for me to go through all of them. So if there is one that catches your eye out of this list, please go ahead and try it out and see for yourself. But for now, let's do a couple. So let's say I wanted to clear that list out. I could call student list.clear and try to do that same for loop. I shouldn't expect to see any students. From here, we can pair this with something that we learned in the if statement section. So we can say if student list and use the is empty method that will return true if this list is empty and return false if it's not. Pretty obvious there. Just say this list is empty. Let's try that out. What else could we do? Well, let's say Joe is no longer a student and we want to remove Joe from our list. What we can do is use the index of method to first get the index of Joe. And this is how you can think about an index. I added Mark first, I added Joe second, I added Sarah third. Now list doesn't start at one, it starts at zero. So the index of Mark isn't one, it's zero. The index of Joe is one and the index of Sarah is two. And if I added third person, call Maria, uh, Maria would be the index of three. 
So what this is going to do is that it's going to return me the index of Joe. So I'll need to store that in an integer. And then I can call another method, remove. And this will remove whatever string is in that index. So this will find Joe, which is number one, and it'll go remove the number one item, which is the second item. I know it's a little confusing at first, but it'll go and remove Joe. So if I now get rid of this line of code and I try to do a for loop on my list, even though I've added Joe, I've removed him here, so I shouldn't be able to see Joe. Cool, don't see Joe. Some other cool things that you can do are utilize the dot contains method of a list and see if a list contains a certain variable. So let's see if Sarah exists in this list. Just to make it a little more dynamic. So you can write it both those ways. Cool. And then let's combine this with what we learned about methods. So let's say I had a method to check if a student exists. And I want that method to return true or false if the student existed. What I could do is pass in a list of strings. I'll call it students in this method. And then pass in a string of the student to check for. And in this method, we can basically take this code, move it up over here. Oops. So if our list of students contains this student, don't worry about the debug, just return true. Otherwise, let's return false. Definitely didn't mean to do that. Cool. And then we can call the student exist from here and pass in our list of students and just pass in Sarah. Now, this is probably not something you'll do in the real world and it doesn't fully go into all the complex things that you can do with lists, but it's a good beginner way of understanding what they are capable of and then also mixing them with what we learned in some of the previous videos. Another useful method of the list class is dot size. We can use that to print out how many elements are in this list. Called dot size. So we saw four, which makes sense because there were four students. There's also a cool sort method if you ever needed to use that as well. That sorts the items in ascending order. So if I were to write a for loop here, I would see that these get sorted in alphanumeric order. This is a really powerful data structure that you will be leveraging a lot especially once we get to the trigger section, but also throughout any of the other Apex code that you're writing. Um, it's really useful to be able to compartmentalize your code. And then as we talk about processes that take place within Apex, so that's handling hundreds, thousands of records all at once. This is where this feature in this class really comes in handy for us to be able to handle large amounts of data. I'll see you guys in the next videos.